So issue number two is the paleo preference for meat. Uh, you know, paleo rationale that they should be eating all of this meat is meat that, this is what they say, meat is essential to health, providing many nutrients that are not provided by plants, like vitamin B12 and vitamin K2 and carnitine and taurine and conjugated linoleic acid. Uh, eating meat results in higher protein, lower carbohydrate intakes, reducing our risk of chronic disease. So those are the claims. So let's take a look at those claims. Nutrients necessary in meat. Do we really need meat for vitamin B12? Well, the answer is we can get B12 from fortified foods. We can get B12 from supplements. Uh, there's even some evidence to suggest we could get B12 from some like chlorella and, and blue-green algae. So there are other sources of B12, but what paleo people probably don't recognize is the Institute of Medicine and in countries around the world recommend that everyone over 50 years of age get their B12 from the same place as vegans get their B12. Why? Because B12 is bound to protein in animal foods. And when you reach 50 years of age plus, the amount of enzymes and the amount of digestive acids you produce may not be sufficient to cleave the B12 off the protein it's bound to. And so you may end up thinking you've got a really good source of B12, but you can't get the B12 from the animal products. So the recommendation is that everyone over 50 get their B12 from fortified foods or supplements. Uh, vitamin K2, well, anybody with a healthy gut flora, and what we know, if you heard my first lecture, is vegans have a healthier gut flora than, than omnivores. So we have a healthy gut flora. If you have a healthy gut flora, you should be able to, to, to do this little conversion of vitamin K1 that you get from plants into vitamin K2, which we need. Um, now, if you've taken antibiotics, then you may not be able to do that conversion for a while. So you might want to take some K2. But we also can get it from, do you say natto? Natto is the fermented soy, or of course from supplements if we so choose. So what about carnitine and taurine? Well, both of these amino acids are adequately produced in most vegetarians. We have a little bit lower levels, but we still produce plenty. Um, and we have concerns about carnitine and TMAO production. You don't want to be eating massive amounts of carnitine. So TMAO, are you familiar with TMAO? This is trimethylamine oxide and, and um, trimethylamine N-oxide to be precise. But, but what this is, is when people eat meat or eggs, there are certain uh, components of these foods, and one being carnitine, another being choline. That, that when they enter your gut, you have microflora, or omnivores have microflora in their gut, that convert these things into something called TMA. And the TMA gets shuttled to the liver where it gets converted to TMAO. And TMAO is highly atherogenic. It causes us to lay down plaque in our blood vessels and increases our risk for heart disease and kidney disease. And so TMAO is not something you want to be making a lot of. What's really interesting is vegans don't make any. Even if you take a carnitine supplement, you don't make TMA because you don't have the bad bacteria in your gut to produce it. So this is a, you know, one of the benefits of, of being vegan, I would say. But these uh, amino acids are not to be concerned about. Conjugated linoleic acid, or CLA, the clinical evidence does not suggest any health advantage to consuming preformed CLA. We don't have to worry about it. What about the claim that you'll get reduced disease risk? Well, actually, we do have a growing number of small clinical trials that suggest impressive short-term improvements in body weight, satiety, lipid profiles, blood glucose, insulin sensitivity, inflammation, blood pressure, using paleo-style diets. Why the favorable results? Well, paleo diets significantly reduce foods that are linked to obesity and chronic disease. So you're eliminating refined grains, refined sugar, refined fats and oils, fast foods, uh, fried foods, uh, processed meat like bacon, ham, wieners, high-fat dairy products like cheese and ice cream and alcohol. 
So if you remove all of those things, you might get some, you know, some, some good things happening. However, what you need to understand is clinical trial paleo diets do not equal popular paleo diets. You saw the numbers when I analyzed the three days worth of menus. They were getting 53% of calories from fat, 19% saturated fat. So they were getting a lot of not such good things. The clinical trials, they are very carefully designing these diets so that the fat is around 20 to 30%, the saturated fat is low. So this is, you know, a big clue here. Um, and, and so, and also they load the diets up with vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds. So paleo menus are just way less rigid for most people. They're using oil, they're using processed meat, they're using salt, and definitely not the same as clinical trials. The other thing we need to, to recognize is we've only got very short-term clinical trials, and in my view, it's short-term gain for long-term pain. Uh, paleo diets induce weight, weight loss, and we see favorable lab results in the short term, but there are really significant concerns to adopting such diets in the long term. Uh, and so there's one study from um, Harvard, uh, 2014, that looked at over 4,000 post-heart attack survivors, and this is in the Nurses' Health Study and the Health Professionals Study, um, and they found that those that were adhering to a low-carbohydrate diet, high in animal sources of protein, uh, this, was a, this diet was associated with a 33% increase in all-cause all mortality and a 51% increase in cardiovascular disease mortality. And they said that an increase in adherence to a plant-based lower-carbohydrate diet was not associated with uh, changes in all-cause or cardiovascular mortality. And there are many concerns with meat. Uh, animal protein, um, it, it, as you, uh, if you've ever read uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Colin Campbell's work, if you've looked at any of the new research on animal protein, I'll talk a little, I'll tell you about some of it. Uh, you'll know that animal protein is not all it's cracked up to be. Uh, there are a lot of agrochemicals in, in meat. Uh, again, the carnitine, uh, there's endotoxins. Do you know what endotoxins are? These are toxins that uh, meat has a lot, is contaminated with a lot of bacteria, and dead bacteria, when it, 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 it decomposes, there are very significant toxins that are highly inflammatory, uh, and so these are endotoxins. Uh, environmental contaminants, persistent organic pollutants like dioxins and PCBs. Uh, heme iron, which is a pro-oxidant. Uh, hormones and antibiotics, uh, new 5GC, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule in animal flesh foods, uh, nitrosamines from processed meat, uh, products of oxidation when you cook the meat, like heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, advanced glycation end products, uh, saturated fat and cholesterol, um, and we see an upregulation of cancer-promoting genes when meat is consumed. There are a lot of concerns with meat. There is a scientific consensus on meat. The scientific report of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee said um, that the, the committee's examination of the association between dietary patterns and various health outcomes revealed remarkable consistency in both findings and implications for all conclusions, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, diabetes, et cetera, with moderate to strong evidence Higher intake of red and processed meat was identified as being detrimental to health. That's from the USDA. If we look at the most recent meta-analyses on red meat and mortality, very consistently, red meat and processed meat increase mortality from anywhere between you know, 10, 5, 10% 10 to 44% for processed meat. 
uh, meat and diabetes, and not just red and processed meat, but also total meat and poultry. We see consistently they all increase diabetes risk, and some profoundly, a serving increasing risk by 51% for processed meat. And even for unprocessed meat, as high as, as you know, uh, 20%. And for total red meat, again, as high as almost 50% in a couple of studies. If we look at red meat and cardiovascular disease, it's the same story all over again. You can see unprocessed meat less damaging than processed meat, but both uh, increasing risk. If we look at unprocessed red meat and cancer, again, we see consistent increases of risk in every type of cancer, colorectal cancer, glioma, brain cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, lung cancer, and you know, it's just the same story for, for all of these um, uh, types of cancers. Processed meat and cancer, even higher numbers. Uh, the current recommendations from the American Institute of Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund is to limit intake of red meat and avoid processed meat. They say people who eat red meat should consume less than 500 grams or 18 ounces a week or 2.5 ounces, 70 grams a day. Very little, if any, to be processed. In 2015, the World Health Organization declared processed meat a group 1 human carcinogen and red meat a group 2A or probable human carcinogen. So this is, you know, this, it, I, I, uh, when I think about this, I think, you know, we've got all of these um, uh, cancer organizations and I can remember not so many years ago, it was probably three or four years ago, uh, walking by a cancer fundraiser and they were selling hot dogs. Uh, it, you know, selling hot dogs, it, it, it's like selling cigarettes to raise money for cancer research. Uh, so we know it's in the same category now. It's in the same category as cigarettes, alcohol, asbestos, and arsenic. <laughs> so this is, this is something people need to be aware of. Uh, there's another study, the health, a Harvard Health Professional Study that came out in 2016. Over 130 par participants that were followed for about 30 years. And here's what they found. They found that if we replace, we replace animal protein with plant protein and, and just 3% of calories from animal protein with plant protein, we would reduce risk of death by 34% if we're replacing just 3% of calories of processed meat with 3% of calories from plant protein. 12% for unprocessed meat, 19% for eggs, 8% for dairy, 6% for fish, 6% for poultry. The author conclusion, high animal protein intake is positively associated with mortality and high plant protein intake is inversely associated with mortality. Substitution of plant protein for animal protein is recommended. There was another study in 2014 by Levine, and he took over 6,000 participants. This was 18-year follow-up, looking at people age 50 years plus, and people who were consuming at least 20% of their calories from protein. So, People of 50 to 65 years of age, over 20% of calories from protein, increased their risk of mortality by 74%, increased the risk of cancer death by 433%, that's over four times, increased their diabetes risk by 393%. And this is what's interesting. The associations were abolished or greatly attenuated with plant protein, which means this didn't hold true if the 20% of protein was coming from plants. It only held true if the protein was coming from animal foods. And they looked at people 65 years plus, and they found the higher protein intakes were actually an advantage, except it increased risk of diabetes about 10 times. So, you might wonder why. Why did people 50 to 65 years of age, why were they at so much greater risk for disease and death with 20% plus of calories from protein? 
whereas people over 65 weren't. I thought about that myself. So I did a little bit of math. And protein absorption, first of all, is significantly diminished in seniors. So even if they're eating more protein, they're not actually absorbing as much into their bloodstreams. But even at 20% of calories from protein, senior, seniors don't eat as much. And so if you look at protein intakes of 20%, you look at um, 1,600 calories, which a senior might be eating, that's 80 grams of protein. That's precisely what the Australian government says uh, a, a man over 70 years of age should be consuming. Actually, theirs is 81 grams of protein. So 1,600, they're, they're bang on because they're not absorbing. You know, they're only absorbing 75% of that probably. So they're getting exactly what they need to get, about 60 grams, right? Well, a younger man eating 2,800 calories would be getting 140 grams of protein. There's a big difference there. And he's absorbing it well. So that's probably why they didn't see the same kind of results with older people. There was another study called Is Meat Killing Us? Mayo Clinic 2016. And this is a very highly respected organization. They reviewed six studies, over 3 million participants. They found a strong, consistent association. They found strong, consistent evidence that increased intake of red meat, especially processed red meat, is associated with increased all-cause mortality. And vegan diets, and they use the word vegan, vegan diets improve several parameters of health, including reversal of, of cardiovascular disease, decreased BMI, decreased risk of diabetes, and decreased blood pressure. And their conclusion, avoidance of red and processed meat and a diet rich in plant-based whole foods, including fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and legumes, is a sound evidence-based recommendation.